This is just a brief summary of what happens, you know, in the last period. And uh, my talk is, the title is the Biology with Hundreds of Codes. You know, now we are getting in the, we are changing from, from uh, a period in which there were only a few codes and people were scared. Now we got hundreds of them. Now, does it make a difference? That's important. That was I was trying to, I was going to uh, discuss about that. So, one year ago, I had a list of about 50 biological codes, but I was aware that I, it was growing. So I asked Robert Prince, which is here with us, to update it. And in a few months, he came up with a list of more than 200 codes. A list that has taken everybody by surprise, especially because it has continued to grow, and even today there is no site that has reached the limit. But are they real codes or processes which have been given the name of codes, but codes are not? Now, a code is real if it is not determined by the laws of physics and chemistry, which means that if it is made of arbitrary rules. And the rules are arbitrary if they can be chosen, if they have been chosen from a potentially unlimited number of possibilities. The rules of the genetic code are arbitrary because many laboratory experiments have shown that the transfer RNAs, the adapters that actually implement the code, can be modified in countless different ways. This means that at the beginning of the evolution of the genetic code, there was a potentially unlimited number of adapters and, uh, and therefore a potentially limited number of coding rules. And the potentially limited number of rules means that the rules are arbitrary. That's what we need to, how we prove that the code is a real code. Look for the adapters and see if they can be changed in many different ways. And it's a bit like in the Morse code, you, you have a correspondence between the letters of the alphabet and groups of dots and dashes. And to any letter of the alphabet, you could associate any groups of dots and dashes. I mean, the number of possibilities is, is unlimited. And then, of course, then you have to choose one particular set of correspondence in order to have a precise code. So that's how we are, we are uh, that's the, mean, the way in which we can prove that codes are real by looking at the adapters and they say they can be modified or not. To the best of our knowledge, the other biological codes that have been discovered so far have adapters that can be modified in countless different ways and are therefore real codes. Now, this might not be true in all cases. Mistakes are always possible, but it is true for most of them. And this means that the existence of hundreds of codes in living system is an experimental reality. Now, <clears throat> let us take a closer look now at these codes. One of the most important characteristics of the biological codes is their long-term conservation. The genetic code is present in all living cells, and this means that it appeared in a common ancestors and has been transmitted to all living creatures ever since. The genetic code, in other words, has been conserved for almost 4 billion years. It is, in fact, the sole entity that has survived since the beginning of life. Now, Howard Patti and Stephen Jay Gould have proposed that the conservation of the genetic code is due to the fact that codes are constraints. And constraints, by definition, cannot change. Now, in reality, all the components of the genetic code are transmitted by genes and are subject to mutation like all other genes. Their conservation is not due to the fact that they do not change. It is due to the fact that they do change, but any change is immediately recognized and destroyed. That's 
the mechanism by which the genetic code is conserved. Uh, the conservation of the genetic code, in other words, is the result of a biological mechanism that is continuously at work and has nothing to do with the immutable constraints of physics and chemistry. This conservation mechanism is also at work in the other codes of life, of, in the other codes of the cell, but to a less extreme extent. In the splicing codes, for example, some genetic mutations are tolerated. And the result of this is that they are responsible for over 20% of all inherited diseases. So that's another aspect of it. Change code and you get an inherited disease. If you if the <clears throat> if the conservation mechanism allowed for some variation. So, all the components of the cell are subject to genetic changes, but the codes are highly conserved because there is a biological, an active biological process that removes the vast majorities of these changes. The highest priority of the cell, in other words, is the conservation of its codes. And this tells us something new about the cell. It tells us that the cell is a code poetic system, which is a system that has the ability to generate and to conserve its own code. Everything else in the cell can change, and it did change in the course of time. But those things are, must be conserved. Those are. Uh, the existence of a code in conclusion is based on two distinct parts, a code exploration, and the code conservation part. These are the two sites that are at the basis of the codes of life. Now, let's go into more specific details, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The greatest divide in life is between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, between cells that do not have a nucleus and cells that have one. The prokaryotes are continuously evolving, and yet in billions of years they have not changed their forms and their dimension. I mean, they have not changed their complexity. An experimental proof of this is the fact that the fossil stromatolites of 2.5 billion years ago are identical to the modern stromatolites, and the fossil cyanobacteria have the same form and the same dimensions of, the, of modern cyanobacteria. The eukaryotes, on the contrary, have become increasingly complex, and we need to understand why. There are cells that could not increase their complexity, and cells that steadily increased it. Now, a solution has come from the number of their coasts. Prokaryotes have far fewer coasts than eukaryotes, and this suggests that they did not increase their complexity because they stopped evolving new coasts whereas eukaryotes became increasingly more complex because they continue to evolve new codes. The prokaryotes, in other words, have lost the exploring part of the code poiesis. But they are still code poiesis system, but they, they have maintained the conservation part of the code system. The eukaryotes have continued to evolve new codes much longer than prokaryotes, but not indefinitely. They've done so for about 2 billion years, roughly from 3.5 to 1.5 billion years ago, but eventually they too stopped evolving new codes. And that is the event that gave origin to the modern eukaryotic cell. But why? Why did the mechanism that evolve at the cellular level reappear in multicellular systems? Now, <clears throat> let us take a look now at embryonic developments in animals. Now, animals are a population of cells that are organized in three-dimensional structures, and comparative anatomy tells us that there have been three experiments to that purpose. More precisely, animals have been obtained with one, two, or three germ layers. 
One germ layers produce bodies which have no symmetry, and they are the sponges. Two germ layers generated bodies with one axis of symmetry, the hydra, the corals, and the, the medusa. And three germ layers gave origin to everything else, other animals, to bodies with three axes of symmetries, vertebrates and invertebrates alike. Now, in order to form a body with three axes of symmetry, the cell has to be given specific instructions. More precisely, they must be instructed that their position is anterior or posterior, dorsal or ventral, and proximal or distal in respect to their surrounding cells. That's how the cell uh, generated a three-dimensional structure. They don't look for big things. They look for if they, what position they have in respect to their surrounding cells. And how, that's how they build the body, actually. So it has been found that uh, the body plan is building stages under the controls of genes that have been called host genes, Hox gene, because they contain a homeobox, a sequence of 180 nucleotides that encode the strings of 60 amino acids as the ability, which has the ability to bind to DNA. Now, in embryonic developments, in other words, there are two types of genes. The genes that determine the histological fate of the cells, in their muscle or nervous or whatever, and uh, the genes that determine their position in space. Now, the body plan is controlled by Hox gene, but this gene are, are used in different combinations in various parts of the body and in different stages of embryonic development. And this means that they represent the rules of a code that has been referred to as the Hox code. Paul Hunt, Kessler and Gross and so forth. Now, the idea that the Hox genes are the components of a Hox code reveal a higher level property of these genes, just like the idea that the genes of the amino acid are the components of the genetic code. You know, uh, throughout, uh, since the beginning of embryology, there has been a, a search for the genes of embryonic development. And the genes have been found, and they are there, they are working so forth. What does not be taken into account that these genes can form part of a code. So there is a higher level of organizations. Now, that they are like studying proteins, they? look, look, there are genes for the amino acid, and not realizing that the genes of the amino acid form the genetic code altogether. Okay, that's a new dimension to the genes of development the fact that they are organized into codes. And that is what brings new animals in existence. Now, <clears throat> so far the, embryonic, the study of embryonic development is primarily focused on its genes and little attention has been given to the fact that many of these genes are organized into codes. Let us take therefore a look uh, at these codes. The first code that has been discovered in embryonic development is the Hox code, the set of rules that determine the body plans of animals, you know, the three axes. Another example of embryonic codes is the rules that associate the histological tissues of the body with their molecular determinants, rules that have been referred to as histological code or transcriptional codes. Another fundamental process in embryonic development is cell suicide or apoptosis, a mechanism which is used to save virtually all organs of the body. A body is built not by just by putting together cells into structure, but also in say that cells that are in the wrong place must die. Uh, the key point is that the suicide genes are present in all cells and the signaling molecules that switch them on or off are of many different types. This means that there is no necessary connections between the recognition of the signaling molecules and the activation of the suicide genes. They are two independent processes and the bridge between them is provided by the rules of an apoptosis code. 
a code that determines which signaling molecules switch on the apoptosis genes in which tissues, basanias, harnwish, full grave, and so forth. Now, another key process in embryonic development is the communication between cells, and it has turned out that many communication molecules are employed in different parts of the body with completely different functions. Adrenaline, for example, is a neurotransmitter, but it is also a hormone produced by the, the adrenal glands to spring the body into action. Acetylcholine is another common neurotransmitter in the brain, but it also acts on the heart, where it induces relaxation, on the skeletal muscles, where the result is contractions, and in the pancreas, which is made to secrete enzymes. So, neurotransmitters, in other words, are used as molecular labels, which can be given many different meanings in different contexts, and this amounts to saying that they are the components the neurochemical codes. Yeah. Another code that has a key role in embryonic development is the histone code, because it has been discovered that the histone modification enables the cell to perpetuate their state of differentiation. The histone modification, in other words, provides a cell memory, in the sense that they enable the cell to remember the specific pattern of gene expression. Now, it is true, in conclusion, that there are genes that work in embryonic development, but the important point is that many of them are organized into codes, and it is these codes that provide the real rules of development. Now, so, the number of codes. After the discovery of the genetic code in the 1960s, a second code, the metabolic code, was proposed by, uh, in 1975 by Gordon Tompkins. Unfortunately, Tompkins died that same year by a... Uh, he had a, a brain tumor and, uh, and simply people forgot about it. A third code, the Hox code, was described in 1979 by David Elder and then in 1991 by Paul Hunt and Kessel and Gruss. So, between 1997 and 1989, Eduard Trifonov announced a fourth type of codes, the sequence codes. And in 1995, Radis and Takeki described a fifth class, the adhesion codes. Other discoveries followed in the new centuries. In, in the year 2000, uh, Strahl, Alice, and Turner announced the Histon Code, Gabius published the Sugar Code, and Jessel now described the Transcriptional Codes. In 2003, I proposed the Signal Transduction Code, the Splicing Codes, the Compartment Codes, and the Cytoskeleton Codes. Then in 2007, Verheyen Gertig published the tubulin code. In 2008, Bosanias described the apoptosis code. And in 2012, Commander and Rape illustrated the ubiquitin codes. So, between 2008 and 2018, Marcella Faria discussed a variety of codes, in particular signal transduction codes, adhesion code, and cognition codes. And in 2021, Joao Carlos Major proposed the archetype codes. An alternative description of the genetic code, for the more the relational model of the code, has been proposed by Steinbuch, Nicola, and and Kuniwoda, uh, and uh, Kuniwoda and Steinbuch in 2021. So, roughly in 2002, the number of codes, the number of known biological codes was eight. Ten years later, in 2012, it was 22, and 20 years later, in 2022, it shot up to. 237 codes. That's the story of the... Now, let me say again, these codes are based on solid experimental evidence, so there must be exceptions, but there is no doubt that they are... Uh, that, that we do have experimental evidence about them and that they are real components of life. At the same time, however, they give us 
an uncomfortable feeling of uncertainty because up until recently we had no idea of their existence. When only a few coasts were known, it was possible to associate them with a few great events of macro-evolution. And that, that, in fact, was the original idea of code biology. New codes means new absolute novelties in evolution. You know. But, you know, if we take into account that the, real, the great events of macro-evolution are fairly few, so you could associate these great events with a few organic codes. But when it's about, when, what about when, when the codes become hundreds and not just a few tens? So uh, this is still true, of course, that the, the association with the, with the great events of macro revolution. But an increasingly high number of code is bringing to light a more complex reality. It is telling us that coding is a mechanism that life has used to solve a high number of biological problems in the course of its history. This means that so far we have only seen the tip of the iceberg about codes. So life continues to be a surprise, you know, an extraordinarily attractive surprise. But it's still a surprise. Thank you very much. Right. Any questions? I suppose many. <laughs> Please. Well, I, I have a remark on your comments on the slice chunk code. So you mentioned that it's not so conserved. And that 20% of human diseases are actually uh, related to, uh, to this code. Now, I. Well, it looks to me that this is an example of a badly engineered code, just because it causes disease. And I think the mechanism is that it's so degenerate that it can so easily occur by chance at the wrong place. Yeah. It, it, so I, it, I just add a layer to, to the discussion in the sense there are there are, there are good codes and there are bad codes, which... Uh, well, uh, well <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's Yeah. There are codes in... Uh, uh, in internet, in, uh, in uh, all transmission of information, in, in engineering and so forth. Uh, there are channel codes, source codes and so forth. In order to transmit a message through a line, and a line is inevitably affected by noise, you need codes that uh, uh, goes around that correct the errors. Now, these codes have nothing to do with biological codes. That's an important point. All codes that come from Shannon definition of information and so forth are of a kind. They have nothing to do with biological codes, not so whatsoever. Uh, 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 the transmission, there have been attempts to say, to compare, to use uh, Shannon concept of information and, and the codes, source codes and channel codes, for the transmission of signals in the brain. There is nothing to do about it. They have, uh, and that, you know, that, that's basically, uh, that comes from the fact, for example, in the engineering codes, there is no, there is no adapters. It's just that they are, insert, imported in the computer by, the, by a human engineer, but there is no adapter within the system that changes. Source codes and channel codes in, in electric are given by the human operator. There is nothing in the system that provides its own code. So, uh, uh, that has been a, a great source of, a, of misunderstanding between uh, biology and engineering. Many people have tried to apply engineering, information theory, Shannon, and so forth to biology, and the result is a complete failure. They have nothing to do. Okay. So I, I cannot comment on this because I'm not there. Uh, well, yeah, okay. I can, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I know. Yeah, okay.
we can go on discuss. But we are yeah. here the engineering president of this institute. Yeah, but you have mentioned engineering yeah. code. You have mentioned engineering code. No, and no, what? I, what? I, I, I was I was saying that the code which produces missiles uh, on location is not the robust Soviet code. I mean, I can jump in here. I mean, what you are referring to as bad codes is just coding errors. So Marcello uh, discriminates between copying and coding errors. In a bad code, there is no bad code that produces cancer or genetic disease. I think this is not, not what Marcello, uh, Marcello means. Yeah? There are no bad codes, but what you mean is coding errors. Well, I, I, what I mean, if you have a human language, you have a verb, which is a common word. And a single substitution of a letter uh, changes into the opposite of meaning. That's not a trying to act because it causes misunderstanding. If a code, I mean, in, in human language, a single letter will change usually. Uh, it does not change the meaning and keeps the text understandable. So, uh, so it's a good code. But if, if it's code, it sucks for single errors. Yeah, but don't take, don't take the. Meaning. Yeah, yeah. And it's not good. Don't take the, the codes of human language as examples of all codes. Yeah, okay, sure. no, no, it's. Uh, yeah. Nature has a different logic. She started inventing codes, and in the end, she produced the codes of language, but it's another invention. It's another thing that is nothing. Okay, and that is well. That has been actually a source of uh, the reason for our divorce from biosymbiotic at the beginning, in which they, you know. But now we are going to marry again, and so we we'll be happy ever it's after, and so on, you know, together, and so forth. But yeah, the issue of the codes in engineering, in internet, in, in, you know, in all sorts of uh, information transmission. It's a whole field. I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have you know, mobile telephone without that sort of code, engineering code. And yet it is important to understand that they have nothing to do with biological codes. All right? That is important to keep the distinction. There are two different types of reality. I'm not saying one is better than the other. There are two different types of reality. Okay.